Thank you, Catherine. Um, welcome, everyone, um, to tonight's British Academy lecture um, in partnership with uh, Queen's University Belfast. As you heard, my name is Kieran McAvoy. I am the uh, Senator George J. Mitchell Chair of Peace, Security and Justice here at Queen's, and I'm chairing the event. I'm told by my colleagues at the British Academy that the Guardian recently suggested that British Academy lectures are great for a first date. So if there's anyone here who's on a first date... Um, I've read tonight's lecture. You, you, you guys will have something to talk about afterwards. It's a great lecture, you know. So anyway, and it's, obviously it's free. So anyway, thanks everyone for coming along. Um, it's also very nice that the British Academy are involved in a process of regionalising these high-profile lectures. You know, so historically they used to be exclusively held in London, effectively. You know, and it's great um, that they're, they're being held in, in diverse settings across the UK, so, and we're very pleased to, to be doing it in partnership. Um, it's my honour and privilege to welcome tonight's speaker, Professor Sumi Maddock. Uh, Sumi is a Professor of Political Theory and Gender Studies at the LSE, and she's also Head of the Department of Gender Studies there. She also tells me she's teaching quite a lot, as well as running the place, so she's very busy. Um, her teaching and scholarship bring together two fields which are often in very distinct silos. Um, these are, on the one hand, discussions within political theory and philosophy, regarding autonomy, agency, human rights and global justice and, on the other hand, scholarship on colonialism, imperialism, transnational activism concerning liberation and justice. Uh, Professor Maddock is the author of a number of key books in her field including Rethinking Agency, Developmentalism, Gender and Rights, 2013, co-editor of uh, Gender, Agency and Coercion, also 2013, and the Sage Handbook of Feminist Theory, which came out in 2014. Her latest book, Vernacular Rights Cultures, The Politics of Origins, Human Rights and Gendered Struggles for Justice, published by CUP in 2021, was the winner of the 2022 uh, British International Association Susan Strange Best Book Prize for an outstanding book published in the field of international studies. It also received the Sussex International Theory Prize, um, which is awarded annually for the best piece of innovative, in, innovative um, theoretical research in international re relations. Sumi is not resting on her laurels. She's now working on a follow-up book called Anti-Imperial Time, the Anti-Colonial Worldmaking of B.R. Embedker, Franz Fanon and Rosa Luxemburg. So, and in tonight's lecture, she's going to introduce the concept of anti-imperial epistemic justice as an essential framework for understanding the politics of rights and human rights in the majority of societies worldwide. It could hardly be more timely. Please join me in giving a warm Belfast welcome to Professor Sumi Mata. Thank you. Good evening. Um, it's my very great honor to be here with you this evening. Thank you so much, Professor McAvoy, for a very gracious introduction and for, um, and for actually taking the time to read um, the text of my lecture, which I foisted upon him um, at, a, you know, and, and at very short notice, too. Um, thank you to Professor Richard English for extending this invitation by the British Academy uh, to come to Queen's uh, Belfast. And thank you so much, all of you, uh, for coming this afternoon. And if you are on a first date, I do hope it works out. Um, <laughs> Rosa Luxemburg wrote, The questions of militarism and imperialism are at the central axis of political life today. In them lies the key to the political situation. She could have been writing today the accumulation of capital. She laid out the relationship between imperialism, capitalism, and racial exploitation. While not quite spelling it out as racial capitalism, she nevertheless argued that racial exploitation was an internal tendency of capitalism. In the Junius pamphlet, published under the pseudonym Junius, Luxembourg connected her critique of capitalism and imperialism to one of rights, and specifically of the right to self-determination of nations, which she argued couldn't possibly be fulfilled under class contradictions of imperial capitalism. As it turned out, the principle of self-determination was not meant for the colonized peoples at all. All the imperial powers opposed it at the time, and Woodrow Wilson formul formalized the principle of differential rule within human rights when he clarified that in his 14-point speech, he had only meant for it to apply to the European territories of defeated powers. 
In the years that followed, the principle of self-determination was imperially co-opted both by imperialists and by settler colonies such as apartheid South Africa, who was also espousing self-rule. And even though it was claimed as a radical slogan in politics by anti-colonial struggles, it, was, it never made it as a human right in the UDHR, Universal Declaration of Human Rights 1948, where it only a- appeared as a principle. By the end of the Second World War, the refusal of the United Nations to honor even the principle of self-determination, much less a right for the Palestinian peoples in its 1947 partition plan for Palestine, confirmed that the principle was only to apply in accordance with the colonial identity of the beneficiary. With this moment onwards, the die was cast and a blueprint was set forth for the differential operation of human rights across the globe. Rosa Luxemburg was, of course, not the first to highlight the relationship between imperialism, capitalism, and human rights. Recently, Susan Marks, amongst others, in her The False Tree of Liberty, shows how the Declaration of Rights of Man coincided with the important moment in the development of capitalism. However, it was the revolution that the world forgot, which bared the relationship between capitalism, race, and rights. To Saul Levercher, the hero of the Haitian Revolution famously took to heart the proclamations of the French Revolution on liberty, equality, and republicanism, believing them to apply to all, regardless of, dif- of distinction or differentiation. On 25th August 1793, he proclaimed, that freedom is a right given by nature. However, less than a decade later, In his memoir, dictated from his prison cell in Fort de Joux in the French Jura Mountains, he said, did my color prevent me from serving my country, i.e. France, with the zeal and loyalty? Does the color of my skin get in the way of my honor and bravery? If concepts have any power, it is the power to visualize and describe the world evocatively. A key concept in the last three decades or so, which has done just that, is the one coined by the Peruvian sociologist and philosopher, Anibal Quijano, who gave us the, the concept coloniality of power, which showed, which showed up the temporal, political, and philosophical intersections of race, capitalism, labor, and gender. For Quijano and his colleagues of the Latin American Modernity, Coloniality, Decoloniality School, Coloniality of power was set into motion with the conquest of the Americas in 1492. The Jamaican essayist, novelist, playwright, and philosopher Sylvia Winter writes that coloniality inaugurates the concept of man to signify the master conception of coloniality's order of knowledge, first as a man of reason of the Renaissance and then as a biocentric man of enlightenment. In both cases, the mythologies of man first as homo politicus and then as homo economicus, overrepresents man as though he were all of the human, as though these were the only possibilities for man, and, and that as though he represented all of humanity. This overrepresentation of a particular conception of man as the human undergirds the foundations of our modern rational world, she writes, and together with the invention of race, modern coloni- modernity coloniality's most efficient instrument of social domination It lays the structural ground for positioning the other of man and consequently for refashioning the globe radically, enabling the indigenous genocides and establishing African enslavement, Latin American conquests, and Asian subjugation. In contemporary human rights scholarship, it is the politics of origins that rules supreme. The politics of origins is a racialized, civilizational, and binary global human rights talk invested in establishing originary truths. The politics of origin stipulates that human rights originate, belong, travel from, and operate for the West. The politics of origins is shared by not only celebrators and detractors of human rights, but also by critical and progressive scholarship. The politics of origins organizes the global human rights discourse into a series of binary distinctions, and you're all probably very familiar with them. The key ones being... West and the non-West, universalism versus cultural politicalism, Asian values versus Western political and civil human rights. The politics of origins, of course, is not without consequences. 
In the hands of authoritarian nation states, it places a politically expedient argument to delegitimize modes of democratic protest and questioning of excessive state power on the basis that human rights are illegitimate, alien, foreign, and therefore with little cultural traction and legitimacy. In critical progressive scholarship on human rights, on the other hand, this originary story shores up the West as the epistemic subject of human rights, although this time via critique, and mainly through displaying willful ignorance and epistemic erasure of right struggles in most of the world. This politics of origins is mostly disinterested in questions of imperialism, racial capitalism, and the onto-epistemic formulations of the human that underpin global human rights politics. It pays little attention to the foundational violence of human rights texts or to the differential principle suited into the sinews of human rights or to questions of accountability for historical crimes which were set aside by the forcible presentism of the new beginnings discourse ushered in by the UDHR or indeed to the histories of resistance and acts of claiming rights or to the problem of worldlessness foisted on colonized people as being a people without history, theory, and without a world of their own making. What drives the politics of origins are originary questions of the moment of birth of human rights, i.e., when, where, how, and why did human rights come into being? What is the history of their birth? Neither side in the debate, whether one sides with the founding moment of republicanism, i.e., the French Declaration and the American Revolution, or with the founding of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, or with the founding of Amnesty International. None of these sides have done anything to displace the politics of origins or its key effect, which I call time-space provincialism of global human rights. By time-space provincialism, I simply mean that the epistemic center of human rights intellectual thinking is temporally and geographically located in the West, so even if the timeline shifts of these originary stories, so whether from the French Revolution or you go to Amnesty International, whatever your preference might be, the location of human rights stories remains steadfastly in place with the result that the geopolitical context of epistemic inquiry remains stationary. The important work that this time-space provincialism does is that it invests epistemic authority in the global north, thereby leading to a lack of theoretical, philosophical, and conceptual attention to right struggles located in most of the world. Now, it's a curious and disheartening time to speak of rights and human rights. These are perilous times for so many people across the globe. And we assemble today at a time of bewildering grief, unprecedented global crises, and extreme imperial violence. This is a time when we are bearing witness to astronomical and egregious global inequalities, the collapse of the ideals of democratic voice, protest, international human rights, and rendering truthless of international law, all unable to stop ongoing genocides. The debris of international human rights law and instruments is staring at us starkly in the face, and yet... It is also a time when no other conceptual, ethical, or moral language seems equipped to take its place. And while the critiques of human rights have resulted in an all-too-familiar exhaustion and impatience with critique, not least because, as a feminist legal scholar at Nakapur notes, the steady flow of critique upon critique of global human rights has been all-too-successful in mobilizing despair, but has done very little to explore alternative epistemic routes through which to think about human rights. Taking cue from this, I feel strongly that critiques, though hugely useful and significant in demystifying the constellations of power and their entanglements, must only be the starting point for the production of new and different intellectual and conceptual histories geographies and epistemologies of rights from different anti-imperial locations around the globe. So what is to be done in the face of imperial rights? Two questions become important here. One, how to progress through critique of global human rights towards new anti-imperial political imaginaries and conceptualizations of human rights? And two, how to shift the epistemic center of human rights scholarship and hopefully politics, policy, law, and practice towards an anti-imperial orientation. An answer to both of these will require telling very different stories and accounts of rights politics. It will require a strident critique 
of imperial human rights and a commitment to the practice of anti-imperial epistemic justice. Not too much to ask then. But you might ask, what is anti-imperial epistemic justice and what does it do? Anti-imperial epistemic justice is a very specific intervention. By anti-imperial epistemic justice, I do not mean prejudicial, individual, and micro-level instances of being institutionally unheard or unjustly treated that can be combated through methodologically conservative and ethically neutral intellectual resources, or indeed through clearing intellectual obstacles to a neutral view of social relations. It is specifically concerned with epistemic location and the material and ethical context of knowledge production, and also with the epistemic presence of knowledge production from most of the world. It demands that epistemic interventions from most of the world must matter in a way that matter epistemically. By anti-imperial epistemic justice, I mean to critique the hardwired colonial unknowing and the methodological insularity and the glo uh, um, on the one hand, but also the methodological nationalism when people do talk about world making in the global south. Just think how easily people slip into methodological nationalism. The problem with methodological nationalism and the many great men's stories of rights and justice that are told in its name is that not only are nation states among the chief violators of rights through their security, development, and corporate apparatuses and interests, but also because of the low legitimacy of the nation state to represent subaltern groups who have historically been at the receiving end of irresistible state violence. In sum, this is a broad, multidimensional intervention into building a framework for ethical and democratic knowledge production. Essentially, it is the imperative to take seriously epistemic interventions from most of the world. And, and, that allow, and it allows us to produce new concepts and retool existing conceptual architectures so that they reflect the stakes and struggles of world making in most of the world. It is a capacious interdisciplinary framework that brings together anti-imperial scholarship, Marxist thinking, in which, I mean, I include that with an anti-imperial scholarship, but also with non-ideal theories of equality, justice, and rights. So over the several years, I've come to a realization that in order to tell different stories of rights politics, one must engage seriously with the question of anti-imperial epistemic justice. This is because, quite simply, the conceptual architectures in place to tell these different stories of rights politics are quite simply inadequate. For instance, subaltern rights politics in most of the world often reflects a strong alignment of the politics of rights with the politics of justice. However, Eurocentered thinking not only keeps theories of rights and those of justice separate in scope, nature, and form, but also predominantly disengaged from questions of injustice and oppression. These are therefore unable to conceptually capture the overlapping nature of the politics of rights and that of justice that emerge within subaltern mobilizations and rights in most of the world. To a great extent, the scholarly responses insisting on the conceptual separation of theories of rights and theories of justice are informed by a set of recent North American theories of justice which are characterized by the refusal to think about injustice as a starting point of their thinking. The philosopher Charles Mills noted that the separation of rights from justice and injustice emerged from a long and a particular history of thinking around what he calls racial liberalism, which also privileges a mode of thinking that abstracts away from oppression. This problematic mode of thinking of idealizing abstractions is neither ideologically neutral nor is it without material consequences. It erases and conceals actually existing oppression as a starting point for philosophical thinking and inhibits the development of conceptual tools necessary for understanding and dealing with its workings. A key contradiction of the Euro-North Atlantic ideal theories of justice, I'm talking about particularly about ideal theories, effectively become the, becoming the principal frameworks of philosophical thinking on human rights and global justice, which they have become, is quite simply that they are anything but global. Their methodological insularity from most of the world, their methodological nationalism, they're talking about the global, but actually their, their examples are very much located in, in the Euro-North Atlantic. Their, oblivion, their obliviousness to questions of global structural inequalities and to the prevailing global coloniality and foundational racial violence that organizes global politics within and among countries, while extraordinarily striking, is also hardly surprising. 
A case in point, of course, is the remarkable methodological insularity shown by 20th century ideal theories of justice from the scholarship on anti-colonial critique and justice, which were in circulation or published either contemporaneously or indeed preceding them just at the same time. Retooling received and mainstream theories of rights and justice therefore becomes crucial for articulating rights politics in most of the world, but also for reorienting theoretical thinking towards theorizing structural injustice and to acknowledging the epistemic dis difference instituted by anti-imperial and decolonial um, world making. So what are the intellectual resources for retooling rights and justice, but also for theorizing anti-imperial epistemic justice? The world making visions of anti-imperial just, uh, epistemic justice will come from at least four different sources. Firstly, they come from pluriversal struggles taking place across the globe. Secondly, from reinstating stories of anti-colonial struggles for liberation and self-determination and freedom, which have been removed from hegemonic stories and discourses of global human rights. Actually, anti-colonialism doesn't figure in any of the stories that human rights um, uh, tells about itself. The refusal to include anti-colonial struggles as human rights struggles in mainstream accounts of global human rights is also an important reason why global human rights law and institutions are mostly unable to respond to people's demands for self-determination and anti-colonial liberation, and that's, that's the foot dragging, right? Thirdly, they come from producing epistemic accounts of rights politics in most of the world. The critical vocabularies of rights politics in most of the world, as I suggested earlier, not only suture the politics of rights to the politics of justice, but also ground rights and alternative justificatory premises that privilege neither methodological nationalism or statism, nor indeed methodological individualism. And finally, we can also harness intellectual resources from non-ideal theories of rights and justice. And recently, let me speak a little bit about these because well, the story I've been saying, I've been t telling you thus far, has focused very much on the other, um, on the other resources. Recently, several important interventions focusing on non-ideal non forms of thinking on justice, rights, and equality have opened up some methodological and theoretical um, insights for both retooling theories of justice, but also potentially theorizing anti-imperial just, epistemic justice. So, to give a few, uh, uh, to give a few examples. Amartya Sen's The Idea of Justice critiques, for example, the transcendental institutionalization of ideal theories of justice and the work of John Rawls in particular to argue that justice cannot be indifferent to the lives that people can actually live and requires an accomplished understanding of justice together with a diagnosis of injustice aimed at eradicating justice. Uh, eradicating injustice. Similarly, Iris Marion Young, um, in her book Responsibility of Justice, puts the question of structural injustice on the table and, and sets out to, to define what she means by structural injustice. Serene Kader's book Decolonizing Universalism sets out non-idealist universalist normative guidelines capable of responding to gender injustices on a global scale. Anne Phillips in her latest book, Unconditional Equals, argues that equality is not a matter of some proof or justification, something which is a priori, but it is something that humans make happen by asserting it. The non-ideal theories of justice I flagged here are useful resources because these eschew methodological abstraction because they start from the point of injustice. And they spotlight the constituent workings of injustice in historical and real time. And in so doing, align with the key intervention of anti-imperial epistemic justice, which is to challenge coloniality, structural injustice, exploitation, and oppression. So let me then set out the key elements of anti-imperial epistemic justice. These are first, an insistence on conceptual production from most of the world. And this is a matter of an epistemic urgency. The glaring absence of a broad repository of concepts drawn from different geographical and non-standard background contexts and conditions lies at the heart of the coloniality of knowledge production. 
Not, and, and it's for various reasons, which many of you uh, will be familiar with. It keeps Eurocentrism alive, maintains racialized epistemic hierarchies, um, uh, institutes epistemic violence, uh, acti aggressively insists on the unidirectional travel, simplistic translation, and radical commensurability of different worlds and forms of world making, and, auth and authorizes and enacts powerful refusals of epistemic relationality and simultaneity across the globe. And even though now that there are important and significant decolonizing interventions focused on theorizing from the global south or most of the world. However, in my view, the problem lies not so much in producing theories from most of the world, but in producing concepts from most of the world. Concepts are the building blocks of theory. They make our world visualizable and discussable. And therefore, the work of theory building requires concepts which are able to capture different political and social imaginaries of life and world making in different locations around the globe. Secondly, anti imperial epistemic justice demands an insistence on epistemic presence and epistemic accounting of most of the world concepts in a way that matter epistemically, ethically, politically, legally. The epistemic presence of rights politics is crucial to avoid categorizing right struggles in most of the world and the epistemic difference they institute as cultural, custom, local, case studies. Think about how often we tell our students produce a case study of this or that, right? That assumes that there is a global blueprint in place and that what is being produced is simply a local iteration, which is, which is what keeps these um, existing epistemic hierarchies intact. Thirdly, anti-imperial epistemic justice is concerned with producing an epistemic shift in the sites of knowledge production from Europe to most of the world. And it demands a careful and systematic imperative at speaking back to the received and Eurocentered ethical, philosophical, and political conceptual languages and is, that is oriented towards not only retooling them but also towards uh, anti-imperial epistemic justice so that they, be, they also become partakers in a conversation on the different forms of justice, rights, and world-making occurring across the globe. So I must insist here, actually, I'm not insist, I must admit, I must admit that my insistence on a concerted effort to produce new conceptual languages to build the world anew is, alas, neither novel nor original. It has been a key facet of anti-colonial thinking. For instance, recall Franz Fanon powerful call to work out new concepts. In the, in the concluding lines of The Wretched of the Earth, he writes, uh, uh, he writes, for Europe, for ourselves, and for humanity, comrades, we must turn over a new leaf. We must work out new concepts and try to set afoot a new man. At different points uh, in The Wretched of the Earth, Fanon makes specific observations on the intellectual content and inspiration for these new concepts. Where are they going to come from? The new concepts are neither pulled out of Eurocentered intellectual repertoires, nor are they products of some populist abstraction or of ossified notions of the cultural um, uh, or traditional. Fanon is unequivocal that these concepts emerge from and also draw their intellectual inspiration from people's struggles for freedom. Fanon's refusal to attach oneself to tradition or bring abandoned traditions to life again is shared by the other famous uh, Martinican intellectual, Amy Césaire, who famously wrote in his discourse on colonialism, for us the problem is not to make a utopian and sterile attempt to repeat the past, but to go beyond. It is not a dead society that we want to review. We leave that to those who go in for exoticism. It is a new society that we must create. For the last two decades, I've been tracking the critical conceptual vocabularies of rights politics in most of the world. This rights politics in most of the world appears as the politics of justice. It is therefore not the civilizational, racialized, minimalist, depoliticized, humanitarian politics of moralism and despair. Rather, it is one that is located within political struggles for freedom, rights, and justice, and underpinned by a conception of justice as non-exploitational and structural. This rights politics confronts the two deeply inbuilt assumptions that are of human rights, which I was alluding to earlier, the politics of origins and its time space provincialism. 
So my epistemic accounting of subaltern rights struggles, so this is how I've done my work on anti-imperial epistemic justice, is to, is to provide an epistemic account of rights, subaltern rights struggles, and that has involved ethnographically tracking these through northwest India and central eastern Pakistan. What unites these subaltern mobilizations spanning India and Pakistan is the critical vocabularies of rights that they employ to enunciate their rights politics. So, go through Amy Suzanne, that's his book on discourse on colonialism, and um, so we'll stay here for a bit. Um, the reason I'm focusing on, I have this um, slide here, is because um, you would note that there is a very particular, depending on the light, there is a very particular word that occurs on the cover, and it's in nine different languages, and it's the same word. All the subaltern mobilizations I've been tracking use the Urdu and Arabic word for a right, which is the word haq, which is what you see on that cover. The word haq is extraordinarily cosmopolitan, appearing as a principal word for a right across two continents and the regions of the Middle East, North and East Africa, Iran, Turkey, South Asia, and eight languages that I've been able to track and occurs in many others, including Hebrew, Persian, Arabic, Swahili, Turkish, Hindu, uh, Hindi, and Urdu. The word itself is traced to classical Hebrew and appears in pre-Islamic poetry and then in the Quran, and it is also found in the older Semitic languages such as Aramaic and Mendian. And in South Asia, Haq appears in Hindustani and Urdu through the influence of Persian in the Indian subcontinent where it was the state language before the arrival of the British colonial state where it cuts across geographical, religious, and linguistic boundaries to become the principal word deployed to claim rights by subaltern groups in both northwestern India and Pakistan. So I've been tracking the deployment of the word haq through the deserts of Rajasthan in northwest India, where different subaltern groups have been mobilizing to demand rights to food, public information, gender and caste equality, employment from the state, and Adivasi groups, indigenous groups, are demanding rights to sacred and ancestral forests, streams, rivers, and lands. The word haq does not recognize national borders and formations. If anything, it undermines them and, and, and the methodological imperatives which are framed around it. And so I've traveled with it further northwest into the subcontinent, and into the central eastern province of the Punjab in Pakistan, where for the last two decades, very poor peasants have been involved in a long struggle for land rights against the military, which is also the country's largest landowner, in to emerge as the most significant working class movement in post-colonial Pakistan. So my conceptual work on, on, on um, my conceptual work on, yes, so my conceptual work on Haq, has involved documenting four different justi justificatory premises of, of Huck that animate but also, uh, that also sustain these different political mobilizations while putting into relation um, a very particular uh, understanding of the self. The articulation of Huck as both an expansive language of claim making but also as a demand for justice, occurs within and is embedded in powerful descriptions of existing structural injustice and critiques of state corruption, corporate extractivism, dispossession, forced displacement uh, to make way for development, industrial and conservation projects, for instance. The critical vocabularies of Haq are therefore co-produced and invoked within multiple and diverse encounters with developmentalism, militarism, state authoritarianism, statism, legal constitutionalism, and social movement activism. And therefore, it is at the intersection of these and as not some freestanding abstraction, some authentic, um, you know, a sort of abstraction that a haq as a contemporary idea operates. So let me give an illustration of the ways in which the justificatory premises of a haq disrupt ordinary ways of theory building on, on rights. One of the justificatory premises of Huck, and you'll see it right on top, is the premise of citizenship. So Huck is often justified on the basis of citizenship rights. But it institutes, actually, a very different understanding of citizenship, i.e. it refuses methodological nationalism and statism by locating the authority and source of rights outside the nation state, even as it is regarded, even as a nation state is seen as having the responsibility to protect and uphold rights. Now this understanding of Huck breaks, not only breaks out of the organic 
connection often drawn by legal positivists between the state and citizenship rights, but also places itself outside of the Arendtian paradox of the right to have rights, which operates within methodological nationalism and already assumed in existing categories of who are and who can be citizens. Evidently, the non-derivativeness of Huck from the state and its entanglements of rights and justice has implications for mainstream and received theories of rights, which tend to recognize the existence of rights only if there are corresponding duty bearers. It also has implications for theorizing rights outside of methodological individualism. And since, since Huck is not limited to claims to entitlements already guaranteed by the states, so it's not a politics of inclusion, and social, and, and, uh, but it's also for, uh, it also sets out and makes way for a much more expansive and a creative set of rights. The enunciations of Huck with their demand for different political arrangements becomes visible in the non-dichotomous and relational connections that are drawn between individuals as bearers and claimants of Huck and the public good. In sum, claiming Huck signifies a cosmic inseparability and indivisibility from the public good. And consequently, the public good is conceived as exceeding the welfare and interests of moral individuals alone, and it comes to include obligations to nature, and therefore exceeding humanism, which is a hallmark of global human rights. Rights politics in most of the world is not a utopian, horizontal, power-free politics. Like all phenomena, this rights politics is intersectionally gendered phenomena. And even while Huck generates political possibilities and shifts normative horizons of rights talk, however, these normative horizons are and possibilities are deeply gendered and marked by intersectional inequalities and oppressions. It is worth noting, for instance, that in each of the cases of political mobilizations that I've been studying and documenting for the last 20 years, I have not come across a single instance where the demand for gender equality came up organically within these, or was raised as part of a collectively raised demand for rights. And so therefore the painting that you see above you is an extraordinary painting because it is making just such a demand. To conclude, I have put forward a proposal for thinking about rights and human rights outside the imperial frame. This re-envisioning requires a commitment to anti-imperial epistemic justice and to knowledge production on rights politics in most of the world. Thank you. <laughs>